This is Covering the Spread, part of the FanDuel Podcast Network. We have got a pair of title fights coming up this weekend at UFC 292, which means it is my legal obligation to you, the listener, to get Austin Swain back here on Covering the Spread. We're going to have Austin break down both those title fights and get you ready for the entire card this weekend in UFC 292. This is Covering the Spread, part of the FanDuel Podcast Network. My name is Jim Sonis. I am a managing editor of digital media for FanDuel Research. Joined here, as mentioned, by Austin Swain. You can check him out on Twitter at aswain3. He is a senior editor for FanDuel Research. Austin, it looks like a fantastic car this weekend. How are you doing today? I'm doing great. Hey, you know, since UFC 292 is in Boston, weigh-ins already to started at 9 a.m. Eastern, and both title fights are already locked in, so nothing could ruin my mood until weird stuff starts happening in baseball tonight. Is that at uh, TD Garden, or where is that at? It is at the Garden in Boston, so a very famous UFC venue. Dana White, kind of a Boston guy, so they've been there a ton. The crowds are always electric, so I cannot wait for Saturday. And that also means that the fights are probably starting at like a more normal time than when they're, I guess, like I'm used to UFC being in like London and stuff like this. So yeah. probably a more regular schedule this week then. Yeah. So domestic pay-per-views always 6 p.m. Eastern. Okay. This one's actually at 630 because it's lit, it's missing some fight volume. But uh, okay. 6 p.m. Eastern is typically the earliest you'll see a, a domestic pay-per-view start. You okay. kind of learn. <laughs> yeah, exactly. You learn the schedule, stuff like that. How common is it to have two title fights on one card? I, I certainly think they typically do this with the lower weight classes. Like typically they could get away with just one title fight if it's a heavyweight title sure. fight or a middleweight title fight. But uh, you do see a couple of title fights usually paired together. Like in this case, we have men's bantamweight, women's strawweight. But I would argue men's bantamweight is one of the deepest UFC divisions. Like it's very different than when UFC started and uh, the lower weight classes didn't get much attention. These guys are actually the most skilled. So yeah. they typically pair them together. I'm excited that we got we got two of them. All right, well, we got Aljamain Sterling taking on Sean O'Malley and Zhang Weilei taking on Amanda Lemos. Those are going to be fights we're going to talk about in full today and then talk about other bets Austin likes across the card at FanDuel Sportsbook. But first, a reminder to make sure you're subscribed to Covering the Spread wherever you get your podcasts. We are also up on the FanDuel YouTube page and on FanDuel TV Plus for Amazon Fire, Apple TV, and Roku devices alongside up at Adams and the Solo Shot as well. And uh, make sure you're checking out the solo shot there for MLB DFS coverage as well. Also, this week's FanDuel Research free roll is now live on the Daily Fantasy side of things. We're running free rolls every week on FanDuel Research to celebrate the transition and thank all of NumberFire's users for their years of loyalty this week. Very timely. It's a free roll for UFC 292. They got two titles up for grabs. We got free prizes for you as well. Lock is on Saturday evening. So take all the stuff that Austin discusses, apply it to Daily Fantasy, and uh, find the link to get yourself entered. Go to fanduel.com slash research. Click the article. That's fanduel.com slash research. Eligibility restrictions apply. And Austin will have Believe a Podcast as well for, yes, for UFC 292. That'll be on the Number Fire Daily Fantasy Podcast feed later on today so you don't have to apply the betting stuff to dfs just uh listen to austin on the heat check later on today on the number fire daily fantasy podcast fo- feed side of things let's talk about these fights now austin let's begin things off with the uh men's title fight between all jermaine sterling and sean o'malley as of right now the money line favors sterling it yeah. is at minus 260 o'malley is plus 205 when you look at this fight austin what stands out to you as far as how the bet break or the, the fight breaks down and any bets you like over a FanDuel Sportsbook? For sure. And what I appreciate most about the way that I try to do this is that I try to take put the blinders on, take away all of the the noise, because when I'm examining fighter A versus fighter B in this fight, it is so lopsided. That money line seems pretty wide, but I actually think it should be wider despite the fact my model doesn't. And I'll get to that in a minute. But you have Aljamain Sterling, potentially the GOAT in this division. He will set the record for title defenses if he beats O'Malley here. Eight straight wins against top 10 fighters. Uh, 
Uh, and then on the other side, you have Sean O'Malley, who has won, and it was a controversial split decision. A bulk of the media scorecards said it should have been the opposite result, and Sean should have lost. But here he, he won, so here he is because Sean O'Malley is a star, and his data is flawless. That's the hardest part for me when I try to break down this fight. He has just one win total over anyone that has a UFC victory himself. But O'Malley has this charismatic personality. He's got the colored hair, right? UFC has made his road intentionally easy, but this is the end of the line. This is as high as you can go without hand-picking matchups because Aljamain Sterling is the champion. And, you know, I have a hard time not backing Aljamain Sterling in this fight. Even when I slant the strength of schedule uh, marker towards Sterling 100%, which it is. He, it, or Aljamain Sterling is an underdog in my model in this fight. That's how great O'Malley is. But I have to override that in this spot because of Sterling's background, because of his experience. And we've also seen him in better domains of MMA. He's a much better grappler, averages 0.8 submission attempts per 15 minutes. That's not super aggressive, but it could be more aggressive if O'Malley is out of his depth here. And it was really difficult to find a bet I like in this fight. I think Sterling's money line is wide. It's obviously against my model. Um, and there are a lot of different ways this fight can play out. I think Sean O'Malley, with his power, with his length, is live for a knockout. Um, Aljamain Sterling could just kind of take control of the fight, just kind of smother O'Malley on the ground for 25 minutes, could find the early submission. And his striking metrics, I'm talking about Aljamain, are excellent as well. So I don't think that it's out of the realm of possibility. He finds a knockout himself in this fight. So I, I ended up going my favorite bet in this fight. If you go over to the round props on FanDuel Sportsbook, I'm looking at this fight to end in round one, round two, or round three, which is, it was a minus 112 pick them on FanDuel Sportsbook. I think that captures a dominant Sterling win where O'Malley is just over his head, as I hypothesize. But I'm also the belief it is knockout or bust for O'Malley in this spot. And that is when he is his power or any UFC fighters' powers at their freshest. Round one, round two, round three. If he's if Sterling's wearing on him for 15 minutes, he's not going to have the punching power that he did when he walked into the octagon. So I don't think this is a great fight from a betting perspective. I really think any specific outcome outside of O'Malley by submission, which is 22 to one, you might as well light your money on fire. It's any, any sort of outcome could be on the table here uh, with the lack of punching power and aggressiveness from Sterling and the grappling. So looking at the money line, I know it's not yeah. one you want to bet, uh, sure. but you have uh, Sterling at minus 260, and you said that it feels a bit light. Yeah. Do you think that the sentiment, the reason why the market may be a bit tighter than you're expecting is because we haven't seen O'Malley taking on these like big time opponents. People may not be making proper adjustments for strength of schedule. You know, what are your thoughts on why that money line is a bit more constricted than you thought? Yeah, I do. Th I do think that sports books have a mathematical algorithm like I do in that they evaluate level of competition. They have certain ELO rankings for fighters. And it's really tough with O'Malley because his statistics are so flawless that you look at him. Yeah. He really shouldn't. If level of competition wasn't a factor, he wouldn't lose to anybody in UFC because that's a He's over 60 percent striking accuracy, 60 percent striking defense. He's just beat everybody up. And I think they're having a hard time adjusting. But also any money source that you look at, Sean O'Malley is the most popular underdog on this card, getting a ton of bets at this number, getting a ton of the handle at this number. Aljamain Sterling largely ignored from just about anywhere you look. You can pick your betting splits of preference. And O'Malley's very popular, so that makes sense, and that lines up with what you'd expect from public sentiment. So I think it's a little bit of a hedge against the extreme public action here, and I also think um, it is the difficulty that I have like trying to get this my model to properly weight Sean O'Malley's level of competition. And that's obviously one of the tougher things to do, especially when you're dealing inherently with small samples in the UFC, trying to adjust for all that stuff and make things really accumulate on the fly can be tough. Okay, so the one bet that Austin is liking here, under three and a half rounds, uh, which is minus 142 at FanDuel Sportsbook. That's like one it's more so you like than one you love, though, correct? Yeah, I, so Jim, if you if you actually look down the alternate, when will the fight end? Uh, it, round one, ah. uh, two, or three. There we oh. go. <laughs> um, I it was at the bottom yesterday. I'm not sure if the market's off the border, what's going on, but uh yeah, the under three and a half is available. But there, there it is. Go. Round one, two, or three. Minus, because three and a half for an extra round, my hypothesis is that if Sterling is in control, I don't think this fight will last very long. And I don't really need that extra half round for the Sean O'Malley knockout threat. So at minus 112, I prefer that bet to the under, which is juiced a little bit more. That gives you another half of round four. I would rather take this bet if you can get both at FanDuel Sportsbook. Okay, so the fight to end in round one, two, or three, minus 112. That is yep. uh, alternate when the fight will end across five rounds of FanDuel Sportsbook. This is why we have Austin on and not me uh, guiding you through the FanDuel Sportsbook app. But it sounds like still even at minus 112, that's more so 
a lean for you than one you'd actually want it back, correct? Right. I think a lot of the equity in this in this lean is in the first two rounds. And by the way, okay. this is the great part about FanDuel Sportsbook. They have so many UFC props available compared right. to competitors. It, there are a lot of different ways you can attack these same angles. Okay, let's talk about the other title fight on the card for this weekend. We have got Zhang Weilei taking on Amanda Lemos. Uh, that is at uh, that is later in the night as well on Saturday. Right now, uh, Zhang's money line is minus three twenty five. Lemos is plus two fifty. It's another one where we do have a pretty heavy favorite here. How do you see this fight breaking down, Austin? So this is a really steep money line for Zhang Weilei, right? And that kind of happens at this top level of women's MMA. Think of Ronda Rousey from a prior era. They become the stars. They get the public support. But I'm just not there with Zhang Weilei as far as a mixed martial artist. She has a, just a 53% striking defense. That's not ideal. It's lower than you usually see at a championship level. We've seen her knocked out in a title fight by Rose Namajunas before. 66% takedown defense. That's how she lost the immediate rematch to Rose Namajunas. And really, she hasn't fought at a championship level in her last couple of fights. She knocked out a retiring Joanna Jacek. Um, and then Carla Esparza in her last fight in, in a title unification bout, one-dimensional wrestler who basically seeded 20% in size. She had no chance to take Wei Zhang down. It was very apparent from the opening bell. But Lemos makes for an interesting matchup on paper here because she passes the size requirement first and foremost. And I've got a stronger rating on her in my model than Rose Nama Yunus, who I just mentioned beat Zhang Wei Lei twice. And the thing about Lemos, she has unbelievable accuracy, 57% striking accuracy, very efficient with big big time power. She's willing uh, to pick her spots at range. And then an 81% takedown defense. A lot of straw weights are just out of Zhang Weilei's class because of size. Lemos is not that. She's done a very good job keeping her feet here. Um, my model still plays a lot of respect to Zhang. She's got the better level competition, a higher plus 1.73 striking success rate. But Amanda Lemos just beat Marina Rodriguez, who is a one-dimensional striker, plus 1.64 SSR. And that was a great win as far as a striking, um, as far as evaluating her striking talent. If she can stay on her feet here, I really like her. My model does think there's value on Lemos here. It picks her to win 39.2% of the time. These odds imply just a 28.6% chance. And the best individual value as far as a specific outcome in this fight, I love Lemos by knockout. I've got it at plus 307 in my model. It's coming back at plus 500 on FanDuel Sportsbook. So Lemos is showing a lot of value for me in this fight, and it checks out with what I believe mentally. And which one do you pick between those two? Lemos by knockout is 5-1. to one. The money line is plus 250. You have value in both. Do you have a preferred market between those two? So Lemos averages nearly a uh, submission attempt per 15 minutes. This fight has tremendous odds to be finished inside of the full distance. It's not expected to go the distance. I do believe Lemos is live for a submission here, so I put a unit on her money line um, and then just sprinkled the knockout prop with a fractional unit as well. I, I prefer the money line because her submission danger is very, very live in this fight. Okay, so whenever I have a situation where my model deviates pretty far from the market, and I think a 10 percentage point gap is a pretty wide margin, I ask myself, why? You know, why am I separate from the market? And does the explanation for why the market is different from me explain away that gap? You know, am I too high and things like that? When you do that, th that process for this one and try to explain why Lamosh is such a big underdog, what do you settle on? And is that that justification enough to nullify the value that you have? I mean, I think it could be as simple as people know who Wei Zhang is and they don't know who Amanda <laughs> Lemos is because Lemos has never fought on a pay-per-view card. She's actually, I'm pretty sure this is only her second fight in front of a live crowd. She was at UFC Long Island last summer, but Zhang Wei has been in title fights. She was in the fight of the year in 2021 against Joanna Jacek in their first matchup. Like, Zhang Weilei is just more well-known. And, of course, she's the defending champion, which will also influence the money line. Um, I, I typically, as funny as this is going to sound, I don't see a 10% difference as far as my model as large as maybe in a sport like you do with NASCAR because – these UFC lines are influenced for very odd reasons. We're going to actually talk about that in the next money line uh, that you see upwards. It really, I do it analytically, but the, of course, like you said, the samples are so small in UFC that there are so many other factors that actually go into setting these money lines. Um, I more so use this as confirmation of my model is looking at Lemos's historical stats. It sees openings for her, and that matches what I feel with Wei Le Zhong, which is she's got these vulnerabilities in certain areas that I don't think she should carry this implied probability to win.
Okay, so Austin's favorite bet in this match is Lamosh's money line plus 250 right now. Fanjo Sportsbook can potentially to win by knockout or technical knockout at five to one as well. Let's talk about the rest of this card, Austin. We've got a bunch of other fights available for this weekend. When you look at the other money lines specifically on this card, where are you seeing value right now at FanDuel Sportsbook? So if you want to lock it in winner, this is not the bet for you. But I see a lot of value here with the largest underdog on the card here. Neil Magny was coming back at plus 360 last night. I'm not sure if this line has continued to move against him overnight. Please, it is moved plus all- 370 now. Yeah, it has moved all week. Um, Gary Gary opened around minus two hundred, and this thing has just ballooned upwards. And um, if when you look at Ian Gary, he is an undefeated welterweight from Ireland who is very brash, a powerful striker. If an Irish powerful striker who is very brash comes to mind, that is Conor McGregor. And these two, you know, they have locked paths, and he's certainly taken that mold on. Was showing out yesterday at the UFC press conference. The problem is, is that he doesn't have what Conor McGregor had when he was ascending through UFC, which is a sharp analytical background and a great record of opponents that he was beating just earlier this year. Sung Kanan, very forgettable guy in UFC four and three dropped Ian Gary, and nearly knocked him out cold. And now Ian Gary later this year is taking on a ranked opponent in Neil Magny. He just has a lot of holes in his profile, 53% striking defense. Gary gets hit quite a bit. Magny doesn't have the power per se to like, just make up for it all in one shot, but he could find some success at range here with a six inch reach advantage. And we haven't seen Ian Gary wrestle or grapple at all in UFC. And that is Neil Magny's specialty. Magny's a gritty veteran that'll put you up against the cage has a lot of sneaky trips. Um, and he's been fighting ranked competition. Neil Magny, seven and three in his last 10 fights. All three of his losses came in grappling situations. He was taken down a bunch, a couple submissions. And, you know, at 25 years old, I know full well, this will be the best version of Ian Gary we've seen so far. At 36 years old, it might be the worst version of Neil Magny we've seen so far. But I've got this so wide that I can't ignore it. And again, this is just based on their historical data, but my model believes Magni is 58.1% likely to win. But there are other factors here. Gary improving, Gary's age. I understand his place as the favorite because he's the more dynamic athlete here. He's the guy with knockout power. But there are so many questions we have about him. Things that Magni does well, like wrestling and grappling. Magni, over a 40% takedown accuracy and a gigantic sample exceeding 20 fights. He's great at that. So I really think Magni can stall against this. If the money line is a little too rich for you, I think you could look at over two and a half rounds, which is plus 100, which is basically a case to say, Ian Gary's going to have a tougher night at the office here than expected via this money line. Yeah, the money line for Magni is plus 370. You mentioned it was plus 360 last night. You said that they've been taking on money on Gary, so that money line has been extending. I want to ask you about your thought process on when to bet this one, because if it's still extending to plus 370, that implies there's a chance we can get it at longer later on. Are you willing to hold out and kind of see if we can get a better number at plus than plus 370 later on? We see a lot of interesting money come in Saturday mornings uh, in different sports and you'll see, you know, favorites extend as they're being tacked on the parlays and stuff like that. Do you want to wait on Magni to see if you can get better than plus 370 or is that a bit too greedy and you want to take it now to ensure you lock in that value? Yes. So I, I think you absolutely can wait on this guy. You really just have to, a lot of the money that comes in Saturday morning, a lot of sharp betters have already taken Gary at a much shorter number, you know, parlayed him in certain respects, had all sorts of different ways to attack and angle this fight. Now this thing is ballooning to a point where I think you can wait. I don't expect money to come in on Magni from either public betters or sharp betters. I think you can wait. Um, I would, I would feel very confident if this line moved back toward Magni just a, t- a touch already because that means post weigh-ins, as people continue to do more tape on Gary, they start to see openings. And I, I, you know, I've caught, talked to a couple of betters that are wagering five, five figures as far as units are concerned, and they have an interest in Magni in a lot of different ways. Over two and a half rounds, Magni by decision is plus 550. And the thing about these money lines is you can kind of attack them in fractional units. So you don't really have to put a full unit down on Neil Magni, a plus 360. If you see value, I have a fractional unit on, on this play. It's not really a, a full unit, lock it in, love his position to win. I just think he's extremely undervalued in this spot as the guy with a better level of competition and all of the data that's quality. Yeah. You should always account for the fact that even at plus 370, if we, if we assume that the market is correct, the implied yeah. odds of winning are 20, 
22% or a little bit lower than 22%. So keep that in mind uh, when you're allocating uh, your bets there. But Magni plus 370 of value for Austin, which you could potentially get a bit longer if you were to wait on that. Any other money lines you like across USC 292? Yeah, so I actually feel much better about this one as far as a winner, but she's still coming back at plus 280. That is Andrea KGB Lee on the early prelims. She's taking on Natalia Silva here. Very interesting prospect in this women's flyweight division, but it's kind of a similar handicap. Lee is the one that is ranked. She's been fighting ranked competition as the established veteran. Natalia Silva has not. Natalia Silva has beaten a couple of UFC fighters that might be handed their walking papers before the end of 2023. And Andrea Lee can strike, plus 1.54 striking success rate. As far as my model's expected wins are concerned, it, it looks at the peripheral data and says, should this fighter have won over 50% of the time? She's 5-5 five and five in UFC. As far as expected wins are concerned, it would have given her the nod in 10 out of 10 fights. So that's how unlucky she's been. She's had three split decisions with the judge's scorecard, as well as a couple of unanimous decisions where she actually was the better, more efficient striker. So a lot of unlucky decision-related results, which can happen with MMA judging from time to time. It's why a lot of these AI bots that judge are kind of interesting. And the one shortcoming Andrea Lee has had against top level competition, 54% takedown defense is not very good. That has been where Natalia Silva has struggled so far. Silva landing just one of her three takedown attempts so far. She's more of a striker. She doesn't really do it by all in, for all intents and purposes. We're expecting a striking match here and Andrea Lee four inches in reach 64% striking defense is 95th percentile for this division. And she's got all these uh, this giant sample to prove it as well. I feel so good about her. I think plus 280 is a gift, and I really do think she wins this fight as the more experienced, longer fighter. And this one does appear to be taking a bit of money on Lee because she has shortened to plus 270. So still very similar to what you had in a plus 280, but it is shortening a bit. So it does seem like there is at least some interest in the public uh, to get in on Lee, which is currently plus 270 on her money line. What about some props, Austin? Any props you like across uh, this card? For sure. And uh, I'm going to go with a couple of UFC veterans on this guy. On the on the prelim card, I'm looking at Gregory Rodriguez. He's taken on Dennis Tolulin. And the last place that you want to be in UFC is on a losing streak. Gregory Rodriguez acknowledged this in his press conference. He said, I fell in love with my hands. I was knocking dudes out, but I am a grappling fighter. That's why I got knocked out in my last fight. And I agree, Gregory Rodriguez. I'm looking, if you go to the method and round combo market, I love Gregory Rodriguez by round one submission here, sitting at plus 425, at least when I saw it last night. And Rodriguez, I think he did the promotion a favor earlier this year. He, he took on a last minute opponent who was very strong, very powerful, ended up getting knocked out. They are giving him every chance to rebound here because Dennis Tolulin is a terrible grappler. Uh, he has a 72% takedown defense, which is not bad but it's also not perfect. And anytime he's gotten there, he was submitted quickly. And Rodriguez averages 2.2 takedowns per 15 minutes, really solid 50% efficiency. And I talked about Aljamain Sterling slanting the competition level 100% in his direction. That's 100% in Rodriguez's direction here. He's fought much better guys in UFC and he's averaged 0.6 submission attempts per 15 minutes. With the right game plan, I think this is over very quickly for the black belt. It is not always employed, but I loved hearing that from him at the press conference that he thinks I need to get back to grab grappling that's a clear advantage for him in this fight i still think he can certainly win it if he goes to striking he's got the better striking success rate but this is my favorite favorite on the card and i love attacking this with a quick submission I think other people heard the same press conference as you because this is shortened to plus 360 now. Uh, Rodriguez yep. by submission in round one. Is that too short? Because that's a pretty big difference. 425 to 360. Is that too big where you no longer see value? Always, as always, shop around to see what you can find. But like, yeah. is that short enough where you're no longer on it? So my model can't project specific rounds, but I've actually got Gregory Rodriguez as minus money to actually find okay. a submission in this fight. So I still feel very confident about that. Once again, um, I actually was talking to a buddy right before we hopped on here. You could hedge this with round two submission, which comes at a longer number, but I mm -hmm. feel like as soon as Rodriguez is successful in getting the takedown, that he will quickly find a submission. That's what happened to Delulin. He seated a takedown, was quickly submitted in his other two fights. I think it will happen again here. All righty. So Gregory Rodriguez by submission in round one is plus 360 at FanDuel Sportsbook as he takes on Dennis Tallulah. Any other props you like across UFC 292? Yeah, I, and I was having a tough time deciding how to attack this big gap in my model where it sees a lot of value in on the main card of Marlon Chito Vera taking on Pedro Munoz to be finished inside the distance. Now, it still believes over 50% of the time that this fight will 
find a decision. But if you look at the round betting on FanDuel Sportsbook, over two and a half rounds here is like minus 380. They are full on expecting a decision. I, my model says it's about a 52, 55% somewhere in their probability. So when I'm looking at an early finish, there's one dude that I believe can finish this fight early. It is Margot Cheeto Vera, five inch reach advantage, massive knockdown rate for bantamweight, 1.09%. That is as good as it gets. And Pedro Munoz, much smaller guy. Um, Vera's a finisher. Eight of his last 10 UFC wins have come by a finish, but the last two came via decision. So that recent memory is kind of in the public's mind, but in, by and large, he is a finisher, right? And I look at this, uh, my model has Cheeto Vera to win by knockout TKO or submission. So that's in the double chance market. It's kind of what I prefer to as an inside the distance prop. Um, my model has it at plus 223 it is currently sitting at plus 340. I, I think the best way to get there on Sportsbook, you go to popular, um, and then double chance. If you scroll down a, a little bit, it, okay. it might be at the very bottom. Now there you go. <laughs> a lot of props to sift through, but by knockout to uh, TKO or submission sit at plus 340. I'm actually, I don't actually see what it says there, but my model has it at plus 223. So I feel great about this bet. Um, and Vera's kind of a slow starter. He often punts the first round intentionally to kind of get his reads, you know, just kind of see what his opponent is doing. And if that's the case and he is trailing late, that aids this bet. And I, that's why I feel better about this bet than backing his money line straight up at minus 210. Because if he's intentionally throwing one of the three rounds away, his win probability drops dramatically after round one, even if that is mathematically, I should say, it drops after round one. He's found a way to come from behind and find the finish. I still wouldn't recommend it. I prefer this as a method that he could possibly rally before the end. Or maybe it's possible his athletic advantage is just starts Munoz right away. This is a late notice fight. He's been fighting much better competition. I love Cheeto Vera in this spot. Okay, that is again a double chance market at FanDuel Sportsbook. Marlon Vera by knockout uh, or submission, knockout, technical knockout or submission, plus 340 right now over at FanDuel. That is Austin Sway. Make sure you check him out on Twitter at aswain 3 Follow all of his work over at FanDuel Research. Uh, Austin, I appreciate the time as always. Have fun on the heat check later on today, breaking down uh, all these fights from a DFS perspective. I appreciate the time and enjoy the fights this weekend. Absolutely. I can't wait. I appreciate that. We're going to have a good time on the heat check. I'll With weigh-ins complete, I'll probably have that guy out here in a couple of hours if you're looking to fill out that uh, free role for FanDuel Research. Not sure what you're doing. I'll give you reasons to consider both sides and build your own unique lineup. I love it. All right. Make sure you check that out on the Number Fire Daily Fantasy Podcast feed and find Austin on Twitter at Aceswain3. I am on Twitter at Jim Sonnes, J I M S A N N E S. You can also follow FanDuel Research at FanDuel Research. I want to thank you all for tuning in for today. Have a fantastic weekend. We'll talk to you once again on Monday. This has been covering the spread right here on the FanDuel Podcast Network. <laughs> <laughs> 